All right, I hope you enjoyed your break. We are going to restart with Dr. Henry. Um, I had the pleasure of, of dining with Dr. Henry and her husband last night. And she was asked, um, among all of your, your literacy expertise, what, is your, what do you consider your forte? And she said, morphology. I think we could see that from this morning's presentation. She said, um, we need more of it. We need to get more of it to our students. So to help us with that, let's welcome back Dr. Henry. Phonemes and morphemes, building blocks for decoding and spelling. Uh, is the topic, and um, I just thought uh, I, I'll start start with a little more history. Uh, the McGuffey readers were um, came along, and um, most of the McGuffey readers were very much phonics based, and. Uh, students learned the short vowels and consonant sounds, and um, they uh, read lots of, of little stories. And um, then you all recognize this type of reading. Here's Dick and Jane, something pretty. Look, look, see this. Uh oh, said Sally, it's pretty. Yes, yes, said Jane, mother looks pretty. And um, that's how I learned to read. <laughs> and uh, fortunately for me, um, I had um, wonderful teachers. And I was a good memorizer. I mean, I only had to look at a word two or three times, and I knew it. Uh, I didn't know about a, a silent E at the end, making that A and Jane long, and it never had been taught to me. And then four and a half years later, my brother came along. And uh, he's severely dyslexic. And my parents couldn't understand why Peter couldn't read. He wrote his name, R-E-T-E-P, total mirror image, until he was in about middle third, second grade. And um, he couldn't memorize any of these. And my parents, uh, the teacher said, well, Peter's unmotivated. He's lazy. Um, he's not as smart as his sister. Girls are better in language. All the old uh, myths uh, that we, we heard. Well, what happened was, in 1955, Rudolf Flesch wrote Why Johnny Can't Read. I, some of you probably weren't even born then. <laughs> but I remember it well. <laughs> I was in college <laughs> at that time. And um, he, he wrote this book primarily for, for uh, parents and teachers. And um, he, was, his, he gave a very persuasive argument in favor of teaching children to read using um, phonics. Now, Jean Chawl, in 1967, about 12 years later, wrote her text, Learning to Read the Great Debate. And many of you have uh, probably have that or have seen that. And she, again, supported phonics, because Dick and Jane was very big at this time. And we then went from that um, whole word learning to whole language um, learning. And um, early research started in a, a, on reading. The big funding really started in the 1980s late 70s and 80s. And much of this funding came from the um, National Institutes of Health and Human Services, ch uh, Children's Health and Human <laughs> Services. And Reed Lyon was the chief psychologist. And um, he said, learning to read begins far before children enter formal schooling. Children who have stimulating literacy experiences from birth onward have an edge in vocabulary development, understanding the goals of reading, and developing an awareness of print and literacy concepts. 
He also said, good readers are phonemically aware, understand the alphabetic principle, apply these skills in a rapid and fluent manner, possess strong vocabularies and syntactical and grammatical skills, and relate reading to their own experiences. And his argument, his um, thoughts on this, uh, came because of the national reading panel that was formed. And this panel reviewed all of this research from uh, NICHD, from um, the um, Office of Education, from Office of Special Education, all kind of showing that children needed to be taught to read and that reading does not develop naturally, which of course was the whole theory behind whole language. And for many children, specific decoding, word recognition, and reading comprehension skills must be taught directly and systematically. And I would add spelling to this, to this list. You've seen this about English being a polyglot, that favorite uh, quote of mine. And you've seen this. Now, this may be new. I was at an IDA meeting. Oh, this had to be 50, 20 years ago, maybe. And two young men um, were speaking. No, it was about, it was probably 2000 or 2001. And there were two young men that gave very similar talks. Uh, Pete Bowers wrote, uh, had a talk called The Analogy of Triangulation, and Dennis Weimer, The Ologies of Language. And what I loved this model. Both of them had practically the same model. And they called it orthographic reference points. And what this meant was, when we look at our writing system, orthography is, our write, is any language's writing system. And etymology is extremely important. That origin, the history of the word, kind of the, what we talked about earlier. But also very important, our phonology, the sound system of the language, and morphology. Morph means form or shape. So, and morphology is that study of the shape of words. It's the meaning units. A morpheme is a meaning unit uh, within uh, words. Now, you've seen this before in terms of the etymology. Did it come from Anglo-Saxon? Was it from Old English? Or was it from Middle English? Did it come at the time of the Norman Conquest, the Romance in Latin and the Greek? Now, we're going to get much more into detail in this framework um, as we go through the morning. Here's, here's a better picture. Here's how my thoughts have kind of changed on this. Uh, you'll notice that I have the compound words, syllable patterns, prefixes, and suffixes going way down to second grade. So this is, is more where my mindset is now in terms of that. Um, continuum. Now, let me show you a, a wonderful, here's another um, terrific book on, called A Structural History of English by John Nist. And here's what he said about the Anglo-Saxon. English remains preeminently Anglo-Saxon at its core no matter whether, man is, whether a man is American, British, Canadian, Australian, New Zealander, or South African, he still loves his mother, father, brother, sister, wife, son, and daughter, lifts his hand to his head, his cup to his mouth, his eye to heaven, and his heart to God, hates his foes, likes his friends, kisses his kin, and buries his dead, draws his breath, eats his bread, drinks his water, stands his watch, wipes his sweat, feels his sorrow, weeps his tears, and sheds his blood. And all things, these things he thinks about and calls both good and bad. Now, look at those words. Are they difficult? Are they sophisticated? No, they're the common everyday words we all use. 
But look at the nature of some of those words. Look at, I don't say he still loaves his mother, father, brother, son, and I don't know how we pronounce that. Uh, look at uh, heart, friends, berries, uh, watch in a way, blood, all irregular words. They don't fit exactly uh, into what we think of uh, as that phonetic scheme, that the phonics that, that we know. So this is why I say this is sometimes the most difficult layer for children to learn. Um, <laughs> I love this. This was on a coffee cup I saw the other day. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm, I'm very aware. I, I've changed in my own teaching. I'm not, I, I tutor occasionally, but not, not on a regular basis. But I, I rarely anymore use the term rule. Because to me, a rule is something that um, really stands most of the time. And when we think of this, there are all sorts of funny um, uh, sentences like this. My brother, the severe dyslexic, remembers one from his ninth grade English teacher who got so upset with his spelling that she gave him that, this crazy sentence and with a, a lot of exception words. I, he remembers it. He can just spout it off. I, I don't remember it. Uh, so I, I always say kind of beware of the rules. Now, this is a nice little chart that my primary advisor at Stanford, um, Bob Kelfie, had developed when he was working at the University of Wisconsin with um, Dick Vineski, who's a linguist, and who was an, uh, a linguist. What they did was kind of divide the um, letters into consonants and vowels. We have our single letter consonants, we have our consonant blends, and we have our consonant digraphs, as well as those trigraphs graphs like TCH. And then we have our short and long vowels, our R and L control vowels, and our vowel digraphs. And almost all of those patterns that we want kids to know can go on this chart. And when I was teaching at San Jose State, I'd always recommend to my pre-service teachers that they um, have this kind of a chart in their room. And as they presented the various patterns, they would place them um, here. Um, now, one of the things that I really emphasized with my teachers is teach the most productive patterns. So the vowel digraphs, um, the silent, some of those silent letters, obviously the main vowels, obviously the vowel digraphs, and all the other consonants. I don't really. I don't like to teach that there are eight ways to spell A because over 96% of them, of the words with A, are spelled with an A, an open syllable A, like in baby or vacation, an A consonant E, an AI, or an AY, which usually is at the end. So those are real important to teach. Now, whether you want to teach E-I-G-H, that's fine. Um, E-I. But some uh, systems, I was saying um, this once at a meeting in New York, and um, I said, don't teach E-A as being A. I said, it happens in three words in the English language, three common words, great, stake, and break. You know, those are better learned as memory words. And one woman raised her hand, and she said, well, what about Shea Stadium, <laughs> which is S-H-E-A. And I said, well, proper names don't count. <laughs> but um, so, so that's just one of my thoughts. To t you know, if you have a limited time, teach the very productive patterns. Um, 
Now, this is a conference on spelling. And here's Dolly. Spelling would be easier if you could buy vowels. <laughs> and isn't that the truth? This is the area, it's mainly the vowel sounds that our kids have trouble spelling. Most of them do pretty well with the um, consonants, but the vowels are what are so difficult um, for our kids. And Dennis, here's Dennis, they're spelling things around me and I haven't been able to break the code yet. <laughs> and that's what our kids have to do, isn't it? They have to learn the code. The alphabetic code is, means that, that letters have corresponding sounds. And that's what we, when, when we're teaching phonics, that's what we mean. We're, we're connecting those graphemes or letters with the phonemes or sounds. So those are terms that, that are important to, uh, to know. Now here's something just kind of filled out, this basic two by three matrix. Obviously it's alphabetically here. We don't teach alphabetically. We don't teach B and D at the same time because chances are many of our kids are going to reverse those. There are lots of uh, books that give you, uh, you know, an appropriate sequence and um, for teaching these. One of the things you want to think about is that this is all cumulative. You start with a handful of, of consonants and maybe one short vowel, then add the other short vowels as you're adding more consonants, then get into consonant blends to consonant digraphs at the same time presenting some of the vowel digraphs, often called vowel teams. So, um, but these are the types of, of patterns that we want kids to know automatically. As they see the letter, they know what the corresponding sound is. Most of the consonants, single letter consonants, have only one sound. A few have two, like C being K or S, and the S of sounds, uh, the S uh, sometimes the I should say the z sound, the z sound, sometimes is spelled with an s. So some of these have more than one sound. So we want to take kids through these basic phonics, um, and I'm not going to say much more about that. Uh, what I want to do, kind of think of that three by three matrix with Anglo-Saxon letter sound correspondences, syllable patterns, and morpheme patterns. Now we'll talk a bit about syllables. We want kids to be aware of the six syllable types. We want kids to be aware that when, when I have one vowel followed by a consonant, or two consonants, uh, I'm going to have a short vowel, a closed syllable it's called. The vowel is closed off by the consonant. We have our vowel consonant E syllables, where the final E, if I just had M-A-D, it would be mad, I add the E and it's made. Hop, I add an E and it's hope. I get that long vowel. An open syllable is where the vowel is at the end of the syllable. Go, be, me, she, oboe, baby, vacation. The vowel pair or vowel digraph, boat, coin, broom, pain, where I have a consonant, uh, I mean a vowel digraph, in the, usually in the middle. And then our consonant LE, as in table, bubble, turtle, giggle, sizzle, and so on. And our R controlled with the vowel and an R, followed by an R, as in car, church, bird, earth. Remember that I mentioned that when I showed you that three by three matrix, that what these different cells show are the strategies available for children when they come to an unfamiliar word. They don't have to guess at it. If it's a short word, a word of one syllable, especially 
they can usually sound it out, letter by letter, sound by sound. So I have a word like um, grasp, grasp. So I have, the, I have to hear those five sounds. Now, we haven't talked about phonemic awareness, and I'm, I'm not going to, but um, that is something that is, is very necessary in order to get those five sounds. We have to be able to hear those. And then uh, if we're spelling grasp, I go g, r, and I can write the corresponding um, letters. S syllables provide another strategy. Syllable division just gives us another way to think about words and to, to a strategy for both decoding and spelling. Because if I have a word like campus, can I get campus by going k-a-m-p-a-s? I can't. I have to be, do it one syllable at a time. So therefore, it's helpful to know that I'm going to divide between the two consonants. And I can then sound out campus, campus napkin, napkin, and so on. When I have a vowel consonant vowel pattern, I have two options. And you always, if you don't know the word, you always want your students to try the open syllable first. Open, pilot, Polish, delight, prevent. But let's say they have cabin, and they see that vowel, consonant, vowel, and they go cabin, they know that doesn't sound right. So they can try the alternative. Cabin, cabin, lemon, polish, comet, image. Now look at the two that are spelled P-O-L-I-S-H and P-O-L-I-S-H. They're spelled exactly the same. So. How can I tell the difference? The capital letter doesn't matter be, because um, I could say polish the table and it would come at, but I have to know the meaning, don't I? I have to know the context. Meaning is so important to spelling. I just can't overemphasize that. Uh, if I'm spelling the, uh, the word read, I have to know, do I mean a reed instrument, like a clarinet or an oboe that has a reed, an R-E-E-D, or am I reading a book, R-E-A-D? So in a way, the meaning is predominant to the sounds, um, or at least you have to do it in combination. So. We have Polish, meaning the nationality, and Polish. And only in a context, in a sentence, can I know which one is which. What happens with the consonant LE words? I have the, the consonant LE always stick together. So that would be bugle, that you would be long. If I spelled it with two Gs, what would it say? Buggle, exactly. Um, if I spelled bubble with one B, it would be buble, exactly. So um, the, the, the important thing to remember here is that you always, divide, you always keep that consonant LE together. And then you'll know if that's a long, an open syllable or a closed syllable. We have some words that have two vowels in the middle. Um, Anna Gillingham called these unstable diphthongs. And, and um, so we don't, this word here, we don't say crete. That's not a vowel digraph there, is it? It's create. How many syllables in this word? It's two, isn't it? It's not a poem. How many of you would say poem? Many of you might. A lot of people say it's a great poem, but it's a poem. 
And when we hear the word poet, then you really hear the two sounds. But when you see that P-O-E, the O-E thing, oh, is it poem? No, it's poem. It's not osis, it's oasis. So I'm dividing after the O, after the A. How many syllables in this last word? It's three, isn't it? It's theory. It's not theory. And you hear it when I say theoretical. Theoretical. Then you can hear it. But most people just say theory. But it's technically theory. OK. I mentioned the work of Pete Bowers. And one of the participants here said that he had heard Pete and uh, Gina Cook and I speak in, um, at an IDA conference five years ago, was it, or so? Yeah. And um, anyway, Pete just finished a doctorate at Queen's University in um, Kingston, Ontario. And he has a wonderful program called WordWorks Kingston. And um, here's what he recommends when you're stuck on a spelling. First of all, figure out what does the word mean? Does that help you out? How is it built? That means what is the structure? Are there prefixes? Are there suffixes, etc.? What other word, related words can you think of? And those relationships could be, let's say the word is um, interruption, and you see rupt, and then you think of abrupt and erupt and, and so on. Or they might be related in semantically um, in terms of uh, you know, have it, what other synonyms and so on. And what are the sounds that matter? Some people think that um, Pete and some of uh, his colleagues have gone overboard on morphology to neglect phonology. And they don't at all. Uh, but phonology kind of comes last. What, what are the sounds that matter as you're spelling this word? Now, what happens, remember that matrix, and we have um, the letter sound correspondences, the syllable patterns, and the morpheme patterns. Um, what happens with the, remember the morpheme patterns are meaning units. That is, they have specific meaning. And we're going to talk about the difference with semantic meaning and syntactic meaning in just a minute. But what happens with the Anglo-Saxon to expand words, to add morphemes? We do two, one of two things. We either compound or we affix. We, by compounding, we take two of those little Anglo-Saxon base words and we put them together. So I have railroad, baseball, flashlight, lamppost, bookmark, fireplace, cowboy, bluebird, starfish, etc. Or we affix, we add prefixes or suffixes. So help, helper, help, unhelpful, helpfully, play, playing, replay, replayed, read, reading, reread, misread, and so on. So these are little words. We've, we've got basic words, but we've added um, suffixes or prefixes. So we can either compound or we can affix. Now, um, think about, remember that the morpheme is the smallest meaningful unit of language. Count the meaning in these words. I mean, count the morphemes. How many in dogs? Two, exactly. Dog plus the plural S. How about railroad? Right? How about respelled? Three. I have re, spell, and the ED. How about, how about this one? 
It's for misunderstanding. How many syllables in that word? Five, exactly. Five syllables, but four me morphemes, because under is a morpheme. Un is also a morpheme, if I have it like unhappy, unlikely. But, not, but dur is not anything. I mean, it's not an affix and it's not a base. So I have four. Now, what are the most common prefixes that we teach first? Um, we have in meaning with two distinct meanings, in or not. We have un meaning not, miss, bad, or wrong, dis. Now notice those first four are all prefixes with short vowels, they're closed syllables. We have four, F-O-R-E. We have re and d and pre, all with very specific meanings. And we have a. Uh. I don't say a ah or a, do I? What do we call this a uh sound? The schwa, good. Um, a lovely word, it's, most vowels are schwa. And a schwa happens when you have a non-stress syllable. It's the neutral vowel in unaccented syllables. So usually prefixes will be, a suffix will almost always be schwa, and prefixes sometimes. A, uh, asleep, olden, greenest. I don't say est. The suffix isn't est, it's est. Careless, it's not less, it's care, careless. The accent comes on the base usually, so these are unaccented. And the schwa's diacritical marking is that upside down E. So if you're looking up a word in a dictionary, you'll see that upside down E. Church, churches, and goodness. Now, what I do, I like to, I, I just make cards for my students because I want these prefixes to be absolutely automatic for them. What, what we find is if the morphemes are automatic, this helps fluency. That automaticity adds to the fluency. And we know fluency is one of our goals in reading, isn't it, in decoding and in spelling. We want them to be able to write it quickly. Well, if they recognize these immediately and know how to spell them, um, that'll be very useful. So you can, I like to color code um, the different cards. I have the same kind of thing for suffixes with the common suffixes. Now, suffixes do something kind of interesting. We have our um, inflected endings where you have our plurals. Uh, here are some another four very um, useful suffixes. These are the most common uh, suffixes. And suffixes have a different kind of meaning than prefixes. Prefixes and roots have a very specific semantic, semantic meaning, like not or in or whatever, but suffixes tend to have a syntactic meaning. The suffix puts a word into a certain part of speech. We'll get into that as we go into some of the um, derivative suffixes that for here, some of these. Now this is just kind of uh, by column, the ones that I teach first are generally the ones we can add with Anglo-Saxon base words. So they're the ones we, we learn first. Uh, then we have the ION. We have most, us, etc. Now, one of the things that you have to be aware of, OUS and ESS 
both say what? They're both schwad, and they say us, us. So how do I know which one to use? When do I use O-U-S? With what? Which part of speech? Dangerous, adventurous, humorous, adjective. How about ESS, actress, governess, princess? Feminine noun, right. These are things we can teach to children so that, that they can understand that this language is not a language, all a language of exceptions. This is fairly regular. Um, look at the suffix ER versus OR versus AR. They all say ER, but ER is usually used with um, Anglo-Saxon base words for noun or adjective. Skater, baker, um, older, smaller. OR is usually used with Latin roots. Conductor, inspector, and so on. Um, it, OR is almost always used as a noun. AR is used with Latin as an adjective, spectacular, popular, and so on. So these are things that we can teach our kids that help them to spell these words. Now we do have to add uh, the suffix addition um, rules, and I don't, I'm not gonna get into those specifically, but we have to know when to drop a final E when adding a suffix, when to double the final consonant when adding a suffix, or when to change a final Y to I. So all of you should know that and, and, and figure that, um, that out. Here's the Egyptians right, doing their hieroglyphic. How many are there in whatever? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, does, does bigger have one or two G's? Does swimmer have one or two M's? Now, one of the things that I think is fun to do when you're working with morphemes is to have kids do uh, activities like this. Uh, you can do this on the board. Have them, you could maybe choose the base word. So here we have friend. We have friendship and friendships. We have friendless. We have friends. Then friendly, friendlier, friendliest, friendliness, unfriendly, unfriendlier, unfriendliest, unfriendliness, uh, girlfriend, girlfriends, pen friend. Um, this was done at a school in China, in Beijing an international school. So I guess it, a pen friend would be what we would call a, a pen pal. Boyfriend, boyfriends. Befriend, befriends. Befriended, befriending. Showing kids how the words expand. This, these are wonderful group activities. You can get two or three kids together to, to be making these kinds of word walls and word charts. Um, this is from Pete Bowers' um, Word Works, what he calls a word uh, matrix. So I have my base word here, friend, and then I, my prefixes with friend could be un or be, and then I can show all the different suffixes that I could use with that Notice friend is in bold, and like is in bold, because here I've got a compound, don't I? Friend-like. Um, and so I, I have to bold face the, um, the base words there. Um, this is from Michelle Ramu's work, uh, Real Spelling. He has a new website. It's realspelling.fr, which means France. Uh, it's worth looking at. 
but we have word, words, worded, wording, wordless, wordlessly, wordlessness, wordage, reword, reworded, and so on. You know, giving kids the sense of how we can expand um, on these words. Now, I want to move on for the rest of the morning to why we need to learn the Latin and Greek morphemes. How many of you are working with kids three and above, grade three and above? Most of you, it looks like. Um, those are the kids that need the Latin and Greek morphemes. So hopefully you'll, you'll be able to get something um, from this. Now, consider our literature and content area textbooks. I just opened um, the book Call of the Wild to, you know, just any pages. And when you open it, page 52 and 53, here are words that the kids are reading. Now, this is a sixth grade adoption in California. All sixth graders have to read um, Call of the Wild. Uh, Jack London was from Oakland, California. Maybe that's why they have them read that. Um, I don't know if you all remember the book, but it has a lot of French Canadian dialect, and they spell that out phonetically. So dis and dem and dos, and, and it's, it's very tricky for our, our kids who are struggling readers and writers. Uh, but look at these words, malingerer, suffering, jarring, terribly, tiredness, excessive, recovery, prolonged. I just took some of the words that had prefixes and suffixes. And I thought, wouldn't it be helpful for kids who could automatically recognize those prefixes and um, those suffixes? Here's some social studies, grades four through six. These are not high school textbooks. These are fourth through sixth grade. Discovery, explorer, navigation, exploration, celebration, exchange, governor, pilgrimage, colonist, constitution, declaration, independence, indentured, oppression, proclamation, representation, revelation, taxation. What if you'd never seen prefix, had prefixes and suffixes? And some of these with the Latin word roots you'd be, have a terrible time because phonics aren't, isn't going to help you. If I try to f take sound out a long word like discovery, d -i -s -k -a -r -r -e. <laughs> there's no way I can get discovery. I have to know dis cover e OK? Um, X. Explore or nav i gay shun. I can sound it out by syllables if I can't recognize, but if I if I recognize shun right away, then I've got a lot of the word. So this is why we need to move kids ahead into this. Look at some of these words towards the bottom: assassination, anthropology, interdependence. Uh, proletariat, and so on. Look at math, Adend, add end, addition, calculation, calculator, decimal denominator, and so on. Asosceles, octagon, octagonal, and so on. Pentagonal, pentamino, perimeter, centimeter, millimeter, and so on. Milliliter. <laughs> McCardle and Shabrai, in a, in a wonderful book, Say, in international comparison, US children do not, on average, perform badly in the early years. If international comparisons are taken as our guide, the reading crisis is one of adolescent literacy, not one of first to fourth grade literacy. And what we're finding is that by eighth grade, the kids who scored on the NAEP, the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress tests, who scored relatively OK in fourth grade go down in eighth grade. I think a lot of it is that they don't get 
these, these words that are considered, you know, these longer words where they have to read beyond one and two syllables. Now, I want to introduce you to Alan, who is a 12-year-old, and he just finished, he finished sixth grade, he's going into seventh grade. And he was asked, he, this is a, not his own paragraph, this is dictated to him by a clinical psychologist, and she asked him to write in cursive. He's going into seventh grade. And he said, um, well, he tried his name, Alan, in cursive. And he said, I, I, I really can't write cursive. So she let him do the rest as printing. He was asked to write the date. That's September 30th, sept. And he immediately has that transposition. What I used to do was I would give this passage to my students at San Jose State, and they had to find all the errors and then tell what, what did those errors suggest for intervention? What did they have to teach the kids? Now, do you, just try reading that by yourself for, for just a minute. OK, so we have, let's try reading it together. I'll kind of conduct. <laughs> OK, truly the hour when he was compelled to develop a composition seemed the longest and grimmest of the whole week. He fretted, chewed his pencil, regretted that he had not applied himself, and thought of other ways he would have preferred to spend the hour. This is not about ladies of the evening. <laughs> In fact, he underwent every form of suffering, except that which involves work. <clears throat> Finally, controlling his thoughts with an almost heroic effort, he ceased pitying himself and produced the weekly masterpiece. Now, all of these words are within a seventh grade uh, ability if you're a good reader and if you're not dyslexic. Um, notice the kinds of errors that he makes right away. Take our and when, um, whole. Many of these words are basic sight words that we're expecting first and second graders to know. And Alan's now in, se in seventh grade. Um, notice what happens with composition seemed longest, grimmest. What, what is he missing? The suffix, right? He, he uses, um, look what he does for the past tense, ed. <clears throat> in seemed, he writes de. In fretted, he gets ed, and, and he gets ed and chewed. Um, there's another one where he has the d. He, oh, compelled. He just has a plain d up there in the top line. So he doesn't know that that's consistent, that, that ed is always the past tense. Look what he does with longest and grimmest. Uh, when do I use ist? Think of a couple words that end in IST, like dentist, scientist, chemist, pianist, all people, all noun people. IST is always a noun person. EST is the superlative degree of the adjective, and so longest and grimmest have to use EST. He doesn't know to double the M in uh, grimmest. Uh, fretted, you can see he has free, fretted, chewed. He doesn't get the ch. Uh, so so ba some basic phonic kinds of errors. Um, thought, who knows where the A came from. Look at, 
other ways. First he spells it was, and then W-A-E-S. So again, one of those basic sight words that we would expect first and second graders to know. Uh, every, suffering instead of suffering. This is a fairly typical error with older uh, dyslexic children. Uh, they they leave, tend to leave out that middle syllable. They're not really thinking in terms of syllables, except that which involves work, those basic sight words again. Um, so you can see a lot of the errors. Now, what's, fa what's fascinating about Alan is he is not your typical seventh grade kid. On a Stanford Binet individual IQ test, he scored 172. Now that's genius level. So here's this brilliant kid. Now at, at 1129, I'll tell you the end of, <laughs> of his story. It has a really interesting ending about what Alan is doing today. Uh, but this was Alan, and um, he, he got better because he was taught the structure of English words. He was taught all the common Latin and Greek suff or roots and the, all of the corresponding prefixes and suffixes. Now, what happens with the Latin, remember that three-way matrix again, the letter sound correspondences are pretty much the same. Fortunately, in Latin, there aren't very many words roots with vowel digraphs. They're generally short vowels, spect, rupt, struct, uh, dict, and so on. Some have vowel consonant e, like scribe, uh, but basic most of them are just have a, a short vowel. Uh, Syllable uh, division is pretty much the same. And with the morpheme patterns, we don't compound very often. We occasionally do. But we tend to only affix. I should say usually affix. Uh, we don't compound like truck, uh, struct dict, spect rupt, no. But I have spect, inspect, inspector, uh, respect, respectful, respectfully. I have to tell you kind of an interesting story. I was asked by, this was years ago, um, about 1985, I was asked to speak at the capital, IDA capital, um, capital branch, or it, I think it was called something like that. It was in Washington, D.C., and they had an adult literacy group. Mostly these were young people in their 20s, I'd say. Most were men. Um, and I was asked to speak at their awards banquet. <laughs> they had some banquet. So the, um, I can't remember the name of the branch president, but anyway, she asked me if I would um, talk about Latin word roots as you know, the dinner speaker. And I thought, oh, how fascinating. <laughs> but, but I did, and I had them um, do a uh, web on struct. And I think I have that in a minute. Well, let me, let me hold that story a minute, and we'll see. Um, Anglo-Saxon base words compound or affix, Latin affix, and you're going to find out that Greeks, the Greek roots generally compound again. They don't affix as much. I wanted, as long as I started that story. Okay, so I had them all, they all had a piece of paper, and they could just brainstorm at their table the various, um, words that they came up with. And um, so they came up with something like this. So here were a bunch of um, words with the prefix kun, with d, with ob, 
within, and then the, all of these other ones. And after the meeting, this young man came up to me, and he said, I'm so mad. Well, I thought, what did I do? How did I offend him? And he said, I said, well, can I help you? How can I help you? And he said, I'm so mad, they never told me. And I said, what didn't they tell you, although I knew what he meant? They never told me that all I had to do was take this root and add these prefixes and suffixes, and I could make long words. Now, you and I know that all of these are related. We know that all of these have something to do with building. We, we, we can figure out the meaning. It's a beautiful structure. It's a beautiful building. If I reconstruct something, I build it again. After the Civil War, who came down this way? The reconstructionists. Just by adding all those suffixes, I get that long, long word. OK, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about that schwa. Here in the Latin base word, I have rupt. That's generally going to get the accent. So I have disrupted direction, d, direction, ut, tra, tractive. So I need to know that I-V-E doesn't say I've. It says if, attractive, elective, and so on. Here's, this was an old Rockwell International. I don't even know that, I don't think that company exists anymore. Um, d, Direction <laughs> is how they uh, show the dictionary. Here are the prefixes. The ones that are underlined, we teach first because those are the ones that go with the Anglo-Saxon base words. Uh, the long vowel, open syllable prefixes, the R controlled C prefixes, and then we have some two syllable prefix, ambi, anti, circum, contra, counter, extra, intra, and so on. Most of these that are not underlined come are usually found with the Latin word roots. And again, they all have specific meaning. Now, one of the things that we have to, especially with older students, are any of you working with middle school, high school? Good. Um, with those older students, we want to get into what um, my mentor, Paula Rome, uh, called chameleon prefixes. And the linguists would call those assimilated prefixes. Take in, meaning in or not. We change the N to an L if the root begins with an L. I don't say something is illegal or illegible. I say ill. We change the N to an R if the root begins with an R. Irregular, irritate, irrigate, erode. And we change the N to an M or a, a, with the root begins with M, B, or P. Now, this is not so hard for decoding, but it is harder for spelling. That's why you have to point these out. Because chances are they'll end up with just one L in ill, eagle, illegal. Um, they may not hear both those L's. Same thing happens with C-O-N, con. Connect, convene, convince, meaning together or with. We change the N to an L if the root begins with an L. To an R before an R, and to an M before M, B, and P. Same thing happens, um, not exactly the same, but we, change, we have chameleon prefixes for sub. If the root begins with a C, that B becomes a C, success. Before an F, it's an F, and a G, and a P. And then add, meaning to or toward, has eight different variants, what we call variants. Account, aggressive, apparent, assert, afford, allow, arrest, att attend. 
So these are just things that you need to know about because it may um, come up. Now, here's the order that I give the uh, Latin word roots in. And I, I make cards for the Latin word roots as well. So I want them all to be able to just automatically know what these say and what the meaning is. Because all of these have very specific uh, meaning. But notice, most of them have, well, this has vowel, uh, are controlled. But most will just have a short vowel, dick and dict, vis and vid, tend, tense, tent. So we don't have, we have very few that have vowel digraphs, which are more prob problematic for our students. Um, I give form, port, rupt, and tract first, mainly because they're among the most frequently used, and uh, they have only one form. Now, we have quite a few that we, we have what, what we call twin bases. We have scribe script, spec spect, strew struct, dict dict, flect flex, and so on. Um, some have even three forms or four forms. Uh, those I generally present later. In the Unlocking Literacy book, these are among the first ones taught. And then in the last chapter, I think, uh, the more advanced chapter, I have less common uh, Latin word roots, but I, I don't have that on, on this chart. Um, now, let's see if we can do some of these together. Find the morphemes in these words. What's the prefix in reflection? How about the root? How about the suffix? Now, let me talk about shun. T-I-O-N, S-I-O-N, and C-I-A-N. When do we use C-I-A-N? Can you think of any words with C-I-A-N? Mathematician, electrician, statistician, physician. They're all people. They're all noun people. So when we have a noun person, musician, magician, then we use C-I-A-N. Otherwise, we tend to use T-I-O-N, Sometimes S-I-O-N, especially if the root ends in a S, like accession. Technically, the root is only I-O-N. It's not shun. It's not T-I-O-N. But two different things happen. If I'm asking a child to divide this into syllables, where am I going to divide first? Re, fleck, shun, right? Between the C and the T. But if I'm asking them to identify morphemes, I have re, flecked, and ION. I would give credit for suffixes if they put T I O N, but I want you all to know that it's ION is the suffix. How about the prefix in disrupted? Yes. Root? Yes. Suffix. How about the uh, prefix in literature? There isn't one, is there? <laughs> Good. And the root is litter or litera. It's really litter. And then we've added eight. She's literate. Then we drop an E, and we add U-R-E, literature. So the, it would be, uh, technically, I, have, I actually have two suffixes there. I have the root litter. I have a suffix eight, and then I cross off the E, and I have a suffix U-R-E. How about collective? What's the prefix? Cull, C-O-L. The root, lect, and the suffix, iv. OK? Subtracting. 
prescriptions. I-O-N-N-S, right? Um, how about reconstructionist? Prefixes. Uh, root? Suffixes. Good. I-O-N and I-S-T. How about pendant? What's the root? Pend. I mean, there's no prefix. Pend is the root, meaning to hang. A pendant hangs. Um, and the suffix? The nt, A-N-T. Submission. I-O-N, good. Inspector. OK, so these are kinds of exercises that you can do with your kids. You can have them circle Latin word roots in the following words. I know you've just had a glance at those roots, but what's the root in the first word? Script. How about the root in the second one? It's fur. Fur. Um, how about in convertible? Vert, to turn. Uh, conference. Attractive. Adversary. Good. OK, what does rupt mean? To break or burst. Do you rupture your appendix at burst? How about spect? OK, how about dict? Flect. <laughs> that should be bend, not too bent. <laughs> how about spire? To breathe, like respiration. Uh, tract, to pull. Tractor. Attractive, you're pulled toward something. Write the Latin words that mean to pull, that would be tract. You can just see the type of, of exercise. Um, I won't test you on that. <laughs> Fill in the blanks with the best word from the following choices. So it would be what? My report card had mostly A's. My sister interrupted our telephone chatter. The building was supported, and, and so on. Circle a word with a Latin root to replace the underlying word or words. My teacher helped the principal at lunchtime. What, what word means the same as teacher? OK, how about turn in your research paper, your manuscript? Discuss word pairs. Compare the behavior of an extrovert and an introvert. Vert means to turn. An introvert turns where? Inward, an extrovert, outward. The payoff for teaching morphemes is that not only are these patterns for decoding and for spelling, but for what? For vocabulary. And what has the highest correlation with comprehension? Vocabulary. So you get triple, at least, payoff teaching these morphemes. And yet, teachers many times are hesitant to do it. I've had teachers say, but I never had Latin in high school. Well, most people haven't. Or Greek. I don't know of anybody who had Greek, but maybe somebody did. But I, I th these are the kinds of things that you can do that enhance vocabulary, decoding, spelling, fluency, um, and then, therefore, comprehension. Now, here's from Pete Bowers and Michelle Ramu. This is his, this real spelling. Uh, that's the, the right website. Um, here he's done the, uh, one of those word matrices with struct. I can do re or deconstruct um, and so on. Uh, the ES shouldn't be there. We, that ES, be, if you've got handouts, cross that out. He also does what's called word subs, showing how you add those parts together. Con plus struct plus ION. Re plus con plus struct plus ed. In plus struct plus er, and so on.
these are just fun activities that the kids kind of like doing in, in groups, and it helps them to then be aware of the structure of the language. OK, so here's our three by three matrix again. Um, we've gone through the Anglo-Saxon letter sound correspondences, the syllable patterns, the morpheme patterns. With the morphemes, we learned that we both compound and affix. With the Latin, we know that the letter sound correspondences are the same as Anglo-Saxon. Uh, there are fewer di digraphs. The syllable patterns are similar. The morpheme patterns, we generally affix rather than compound. Now we're going to move on to Greek, Greece. And we do have to learn some new letter sound correspondences with the Greek. And um, syllable patterns will remain pretty much the same. And the morpheme patterns will compound, generally. We can also add suffixes. But generally, what happens, and these are linguists call the Greek roots combining forms, because we combine them. We compound them. Now, what I, this is a fifth grade paragraph. Suppose you could examine a green part of a plant under the microscope. What would you see? Here are some cells, and then there's a picture of cells. From the green part of a plant, the cells have small green bodies shaped like footballs. They give the plant its green color. They are called chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are very important to a plant. As you know, plants make their own food. This food-making process is called photosynthesis. It is in these chloroplasts that photosynthesis takes place. Now, if you analyze this, these two paragraphs, how would you characterize most of the words as ter in terms of the language of origin? They're Anglo-Saxon, aren't most of them? Little words. You could a green part of a plant under the. What would you see? Here are some from the green part of a plant. The have small green bodies shaped like footballs. They give the plant its green color. They are called. What are the scientific words? What are the words that in the context are, are so content specific to science? Those are the Greek words. And like chloroplast, microscope, and photosynthesis. Now notice. Microscope. I'm combining two combining forms, two roots. Microscope. Micro meaning very small. Scope meaning to see or look. So I'm, I'm combining those. And the, there are no different unique Greek letter sound correspondence in that. But look at chloroplasts. I'm combining again chloro. Chlor plus a, a, what we call a connective, O, plast. What's uniquely Greek in terms of letter sound correspondence with chloroplast? The CH saying K. In Anglo Saxon, the CH says what? If it's a French Latinate word, what does the CH say? Like champagne or chef or mustache, OK? So the CH can end up being one of three different sounds. How about photosynthesis? What's uniquely Greek letter sound correspondence in that word? The PH saying th, and the Y as a short I is very common. So those are the main changes. We have some very rare letter sound correspondences, like MN in mnemonics, PN in pneumonia, and so on. RH as in rhinoceros. Those are all Greek. Yeah, I've got a list of those here for you. The, the three main ones, the PH, CH, and the Y is either an I, Short I or a long I as in hydrogen, cyclops as an open syllable. 
And then the less common, the PS, the RH, MN, PN, and PT. Look at the science text here. Brontosaurus, Cenozoic, dinosaurs, extinctions, Stegosaurus, trilobite, astronomy, at atmosphere, environment, igneous. Again, grades four through six. So it would be helpful to have some opportunity to think about some of these roots, learn some of them. Here's the roots that I teach, going left to right in, in the order. And of course, you have to connect it with its meaning. So make some cards and you'll want the kids, your students, to know the meanings of all of these and you'll want these to just be automatic. How many? <laughs> <laughs> How many morphemes in autobiography? Let's count them. Auto, by, the O is a connector. You could say bio, graph, and the suffix is Y. So, four. How about photosynthesis? Photosynthesis. Uh, How many syllables in photosynthesis? Yes, five. <laughs> uh, how about bibliophile? Biblio and file. It's really bibli and then the connective O and file, but I, I would just take it that way because it's basically two uh, morphemes. And what does biblio mean? What is file? A love of books. File is love like in Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. <laughs> okay. And a lot of snow a little bit ago. Uh, activities that are related, like in and onim are the Greek roots, meaning name, find as many words as possible. So you have pseudonyms, antonyms, synonyms, homonyms. Select unfamiliar words and ask questions related to word origin, clues, meaning, and definition. Analyze the word pterodactyl. We kind of did that. What is its origin? What are the two combining forms? What's the meaning of tero and dactyl? In what subject areas might you find this word? Make a web. Phone and phono. Give students a sentence with an unknown word, such as heterographs abound in the English language. Um, students study word using a dictionary, a thesaurus, find its origin, meaning synonyms. Have them look for additional examples, such as inquiry, enquiry, catalog, and catalog. So a heterograph can be spelled more than one way, right? It's okay to spell inquiry with an I or an E. Again, we have our matching type of thing. You can figure that out. Uh, have a student categorize words in a textbook chapter. So that one of my students did this one on prehistoric times, some of the Anglo-Saxon words, some of the Latin-based words, and some of the Greek-based words. Count the morphemes and syllables. Well, we've done that a lot. Uh, OK, let's try doing this. We just have a couple minutes. What's the language of origin in Philharmonic? How do you know? that You've got that clue right there, don't you? Uh, the PH. How about psychology? Greek, why? The PS, yep. Uh, extraction. Latin, right? I've got a nice strong uh, root tract, and I'm adding my prefixes and suffixes. Hopelessness, Anglo-Saxon. I have hope, and then bless and thus. Introspective, good. Laughing, bookish, manufactured, Latin, good. Expeditious. Latin, hydrophobia. Um, what does it mean? A fear of water, right? Hydro is water, phobia is fear, a fear of water. How about uh, auditor? 
Latin, odd, and astrophysics, Greek, good. It's a nice com combined formed astro and physics. Okay, uh, how many of you have seen Aquila and the Bee? Did you love it? This, if you wanna give yourself a treat if you haven't seen it, rent it this weekend. It's a wonderful story about a young woman an uh, eighth grader who wants to be in the National Spelling Bee. And um, Lawrence Fishburne, who I adore, is her professor, and he's from UCLA. And he shows her this word, solitaraneous, and he asks her what it means. He takes her through solitaraneous. He said, well, what, what does sola mean? What does it make you think of? Well, she said, solar. And he said, well, what does that mean? Well, the sun. Do you recognize any other word part? Well, t terrain? Yes, of course. What do you think terrain is? Well, it's the earth. Well, yes, that's right. It's the sun and the earth working together to provide energy. And so he takes her through all these words, and, and here's what he says. Where do you think big words come from? And Akila says, people with big brains? So where do big words come from? From little words, Greek ones, Latin ones, French ones. You'll win by using my methods, by first understanding the power of language, then by deconstructing it, breaking it down to its origin, to its roots. You will consume it, you will own it. I got goosebumps when I saw this. I thought, yay. <laughs> um, anyway, here are a bunch of websites for you. Uh, etymology Online is a wonderful resource for the origin of words. All of these are really um, wonderful websites for you. Here's Alan at the end. He's using cursive writing. Um, I, was, I tutored him for six months, and he just soaked this stuff up because he was so bright it, it, very atypical. But Notice he's not quite perfect. <laughs> I mean, he didn't memorize these words that were, he, he learned about EST versus IST. He learned the rules of, sil of adding suffixes, why he had to have two Ts in front of it, et cetera. But he's not perfect. He finally is wrong. Develop, he has an E on the end. And I think he has, oh, controlling should really have two L's, although that rule is changing. Uh, in new dictionaries, they're allowing both, two L's or one L. I told you I'd end this with, with Alan, what Alan is doing now. He owns a bookstore <laughs> in San Francisco, and I went to see, to see it about eight years ago. He, he was doing so well, and I thought that was just so amazing that somebody with dyslexic, lots of problems, but he, he had the right intervention. He got what he needed, and he, I don't think he went to college. Uh, he just, he, he worked right after high school at a software, uh, de designing software. He was big on dragons and dungeons in the, when he was in high school. And anyway, but so that's a happy story. So thank you very much. <laughs>